All right. So we're, this is a little bit of a shift because we've been talking life insurance. This is Richard Johnson. He's from the Insurance Council of Texas. If you're the insurance there is only property casualty. There is some overlap. And he mentioned earlier, if I talk about that again here, a lot of the people you work for have both the life and the fuels inside. Actuaries don't normally jump back and forth, but finance people can go all over the place. So Richard's going to give us some background on the scholarship, but I hope many of you, I know many of you are applying for it right now, so you got one more week to get it done. And you can get back on the in industry, and then we'll have class after he leaves, so if you ask him more questions, you ask the less, the less class you have, but don't do it for those reasons. So, all right, Richard, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. Uh, how many people already saw my thing like 10 minutes ago? Oh, man, so you know my dumb jokes and all the things that I said, so... Uh, yeah, that's why I don't like repeat crowds. So. Um, not that the jokes are funny, but uh, I am Rich Johnson. I'm the director of communications with the Insurance Council of Texas. Uh, the Insurance Council of Texas is a trade group. Um, actually, I'll talk a little bit about my background first. So, um, I got into insurance about 10 years ago. Uh, I worked for USAA for eight years, uh, as uh, in their communications and, and public relations department. So what I did was I managed communications plans. I was a company spokesperson um, and pitched, worked with media, social media to get our message out. So everything from um, human resources to property and casualty. I worked with the innovation department. I worked with legal um, and their lobbyist team. And I also uh, worked with their catastrophe. I worked past catastrophe communications. So if there was a earthquake or a wildfire or a tornado, uh, I would deploy with the claims team to um, uh, deal with media, deal with executive visits, uh, that type of thing. So um, really, really interesting business. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. And so that kind of transitioned me two years ago. I, I, I took this role uh, with the Insurance Council of Texas. So what is the Insurance Council of Texas? What we do is we have 400 member companies. So if you think the USA, State Farm, Geico, Nationwide, all the mascots that you see on TV from Flo to the Gecko to the Limu, um, that's, that's all us. So they are, all those companies are members of our organization and we advocate on behalf of the insurance industry with the media, with the public, uh, with the Texas State Legislature, with the te Texas Department of, of uh, Insurance, which is the regulator for Texas. Uh, which oversees rate filings and, and the rules and how to operate uh, insurance in Texas. Uh, we are the largest state trade organization for the PNC industry in the country uh, with those 400 member companies. And we represent about 86% of the property and casualty and workers' compensation market in the state of Texas. So, um, and uh, so, so what, what that means is that we, um, we're a big deal. No, just kidding. Um, that was a new joke, right? I didn't say that. Um, so anyway, so what, what it means is we, we just represent the entire industry um, and uh, and advocate on, on their behalf. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, and like I said, our, our one of our main goals is to educate the public uh, and media and, uh, and TDI on, on how to run a good insurance business and make sure that we have a robust and strong insurance market. Um, you can go research what California is doing and what Florida is doing, and it's a total mess. Their companies are pulling out of those states. They don't want to do business there. It's too hard. Uh, the state makes it too hard. The risks are too high. Um, they can't raise the rates enough to make money. Um, so we don't want that to happen in Texas. We want a nice, strong, competitive uh, insurance market. Okay, so the Education Foundation, this is what's most important for you guys. Uh, we formed a, a foundation uh, in 2002, uh, or actually we've been giving away money since 2002. We formed the foundation in 2007. Uh, and the goal of this is to encourage people, uh, encourage college students to pursue insurance, just pursue uh, property and casualty as a career. Go work for the USAs, go work for State Farm, go work for Zurich's. Um, you know, all those different companies that are around the world uh, or around the country and, and get into this career. Um, it's, a, it's a great career. It's a great job. There's a million different things that you can do, everything from claims to underwriting to actuary to finance to marketing and communications. 
um, get into innovation. You can work with drones, you work with uh, AI, work with our, uh, you know, there's just a million things that you can do uh, in the insurance industry that, that uh, you know, cyber insurance, you can investigate fraud. There's just, there's just so much to do out there. So it's a good industry to get into and we're trying to grow that. So the foundation is managed by ICT staff. We also have a board of directors. They're all executives in the industry. Um, all the money that we get actually comes from our member companies. They, they donate and individuals who are passionate about, um, about insurance and about encouraging uh, college students to get into insurance. So they pay, um, you know, they donate money to our foundation and we then turn around and, and give out scholarships as well as fund uh, some of the insurance programs, uh, risk and insurance management and finance programs that are around the state. Uh, we work with nine, we only work with nine colleges and universities uh, only in Texas. Uh, so when, when we talk about the scholarship, that's kind of important. Um, so since 2002, we've given away $1.4 million to about 680 students. And UTSA has been a really good partner. They've been a partner since 2007. Uh, and we've given away over $113,000 to UTSA students since 2007. Um, so a little bit more about the scholarship. There's the QR code. You can scan that. If it takes you 30 minutes to fill out our application, if you're doing something wrong, it should only take you about 15 to 20 minutes. Super easy. Name, school, GPA, upload a resume. Uh, there's a couple open-ended questions to answer. Um, really concentrate on those open on those open questions. Um, we're looking for you know spelling, making sure that you can tell a story. Um, you know, make sure that you're communicating clearly uh, in order to uh, you know to to judge to judge you all on on your on your application. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give away uh, five five thousand dollar scholarships. So there's going to be five of them given out. Uh, then there's going to be ten twenty five hundred dollar scholarships, and then twenty five one thousand dollar scholarships. This is money that goes directly into your pocket. We send it to you or whatever address that you want, so you don't have to tell your parents about it. Um, it does not go to financial aid so it doesn't count against any kind of any kind of FAFSA aid that you're getting or anything like that this is money for you to spend however you want um so it's 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 a pretty good deal I think that's a pretty good incentive um because we had heard in the past that people didn't like applying for scholarships because it it deducts from their student aid but this this does not do that this is just cash in your pocket um we will be looking at things like GPA although there's no Minimum GPA, we're not looking for only 4.0 students. Um, it might be like a deciding factor between, you know, one student and the other, but we're really just looking for people who want to work in insurance, um, that have an interest, that have a passion. Maybe they've already worked in the industry. Maybe they've had an internship. Um, you know, maybe their parents work in insurance and they've just really enjoyed, you know, hearing what their parents talk about, um, whatever that might be. Um, you know, we're, we're just trying to encourage encourage you guys to apply for the scholarship and and pursue the careers and um, and PNC. Um, also, a, either a list of classes, so you don't have to you don't have to send a transcript. Some people may not have a transcript yet. Uh, just write out a list of classes that you that you're taking. We're looking for those classes that um, you know if you're taking all music and art classes then probably doesn't really look good that you're going to go into insurance but if you're taking classes like this uh, then it's it shows an interest in 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 insurance and finance and so just kind of tell that story a little bit with your classes with your um, you know you can upload a resume we offer that opportunity an opportunity to upload a, a biography um, and that type of stuff so um, if we have a question yeah I was going to say what do you mean by biography what like a, like uh, uh, detail that you not yeah like um yeah I guess uh, more of like an opportunity to just kind of add something extra if you want like if you if you can't fit enough into your essay you know maybe your backstory um, we've heard some really kind of passionate stories about why people might need it um, you know whether you know something tragic happened in their past and this is going to help them through school um, but really just kind of an opportunity to tell a story it's not required. Um, but it's just an, an opportunity to kind of to kind of give that. Or if you have like kind of a professional bio, um, you know, that rattles off the things that that you know that kind of tells your story, um, then go ahead and submit that. Any questions on this? Before I'm gonna get into a little bit of PNC stuff. I'm not gonna go crazy though. I'll, I'll fly through it even a because half of you have already heard it. 
Um, but B, we'll come back next semester when you guys do PNC uh, and present on that. So any questions about the scholarships or did everybody scan it already or filling it out? No, all right, very good. Um, I'll just, I'll just literally, maybe I'm not gonna do anything. Well, that's it. Oh, all right. I'll just talk about the job market. I think some of these uh, industry things might might kind of be boring at this point um, until next semester. But you know, just talking about insurance as a career, um, it's really um, like I said. I, I I kind of fell into it. I was the spokesperson and PR manager at the airport uh, at the San Antonio airport. Uh, kind of a friend of a friend was like, hey, we're looking, you know, we need communications people over at USA. I was like, insurance, what am I going to do with insurance? Um, but it actually wound up being really fun. I mean, some of the most rewarding things that I got to do in my career were, were working in insurance. Uh, you know, we had one of the first drone programs, so I was able to kind of deploy with our drone team um, and really go out. And actually, we got on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Uh, one night because they're doing a whole story about how drones have been changing uh, various industries, not just insurance, but everything from farming to construction to real estate. Um, so that was really cool to get involved in that. Um, uh, responding to Hurricane Harvey when that hit Houston, I was there about two days after it went through and just seeing the just massive devastation uh, of what people were suffering after the flooding that happened. And, and really, you know, they're leaning on you, they're leaning on the insurance company to help build their life back. You know, it's not just this business of collecting these premiums that when something nasty and gross happens and uh, in, in people's lives, they need insurance to, to build that back, whether it's their home or their, you know, their way to get to work. Maybe they only have one car and they need that car as soon as possible. And so you, it really is a service industry. It's a it's a it's a people industry. Um, it is a commodity on one side. It's things that you're buying and you have to buy. But when you need it, it becomes that service. Um, and so the better service that you have, uh, the better this industry is. And so they're really looking for people to get into the industry that have this passion to serve um, and to, and to help people when they are when they're in. So it's it's been a very rewarding career. Uh, there's 250,000 people that work in insurance and finance uh, in Texas. So it's a huge industry for Texas. Uh, very, very big industry. A lot of people, uh, almost 3 million people work in property and casually alone across the country. So that's, that's a ton of people. And right now, usually um, there are 400,000 open positions in, in insurance around the world. Um, they are hiring. This is a... Um, it's a pretty good recession proof business. Um, you know, if you think about flying an airplane, owning a boat, owning a restaurant, owning a dry cleaner, you need insurance. Uh, there was a student that I talked to up at UT Dallas. He opened up a kind of a pop-up restaurant. He said he had 13 insurance policies that he had to fill out, um, in order to open up his pop-up restaurant. So, um, if you just think about that and how that impacts small businesses, how it impacts large businesses, everything needs insurance. Uh, and so you're always buying insurance, whether you own a home, drive a car, or own a business. Um, unemployment, we have very low unemployment. It's about 1.4% right now. At the worst of COVID, uh, it was about 6.9%, which was still half of what some of the other industries were at when they were 13, 14, 15%. Yeah. So when you're saying unemployment, does that just company the percentage of jobs that are uh, open that they want to be built. No, so that is people who want to work in insurance but can't get a job. So yeah, so you you want a small <laughs> you want a small number. So when you look at unemployment, when you talk about unemployment, you know across the country, I don't know what we're at. Maybe six max. Are we even at six? I think we're like, like less than four. Yeah, I think we're at less less than four percent. So that means four percent of the workforce are are unemployed. So with uh, insurance right now, one point four percent. Of insurance professionals are unemployed, which is which is pretty good. Um, by 2030, this is the big thing. By 2034, so in the next 10, 11 years, half of the industry is going to retire. They're going to get out. They're going to go whatever retired people do: go live on beaches, uh, drive boats, whatever. Um, and so this is a really, really good opportunity to get into insurance. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for growth. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for development. 
you know, you're going to come in, you know, in the next two, three, four years, uh, and they're going to need leaders. They're going to need people who are who are critical thinkers, who can communicate, who can uh, present well. Um, these are all. There's just a. a there's going to be a ton of opportunity in the next in the next decade uh, for growth and development in the insurance industry. Um, like I said, retirements are happening like crazy. Um, just some more about the insurance industry here in Texas. Uh, we are the second largest insurance market in the country behind California. We usually are bouncing around second and third behind maybe California and Florida. Um, but right now we are number two. That's just based on how much money the industry makes, um, which is actually $80 billion. So there are $80 billion in insurance premiums written in the state of Texas um, in 2022. And we are the seventh largest PNC market in the world. So if you actually take Texas and compare us to England or Switzerland or China, whatever it might be, we're actually the seventh largest insurer, uh, insurance industry in the world. So uh, very big business in Texas, very important to the state economy, very important to the national economy. We are the sixth largest revenue source for the state of Texas. So we paid uh, $3.1 billion in, in premium taxes to the state. So for every car policy, auto policy, commercial policy, I think right now the rate's 1.4% of all those policies. Uh, insurance companies uh, write a check to the state uh, for tax revenue. So very important uh, industry um, for the economy and for the state. And I think, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this. So there are 54 million insurance policies. So if you think about all your car policies, home policies, commercial policies, workers' compensation policies, whatever that might be, uh, that doesn't even count life, health or life insurance policies. That's just property and casualty policies. Um, so that is a lot of policies out there. The biggest line of business is that auto policy. There's about 30 million, just less than 30 million auto policies in Texas. So if you think about everybody has two or three cars in their family, whatever it might be, each of those cars has an insurance policy. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a big business in Texas. Um, over the last couple of years, there has been some challenges. Um, we talked about a little bit in the, in the previous thing. 2020, what happened in 2020? Everything happened in 2020, right? It was, there was wildfires, there was, there was COVID, um, but people weren't working or supposedly not working. So they weren't driving. So they're, but what happens where people are driving faster, they were driving more distracted. So uh, people were getting in more severe accidents. So medical costs, cost to repair cars, all those things actually went up, which is things that, which is contrary to whatever I thought was going to happen. They're like, oh, nobody's driving. They need to lower rates. So the uh, regulators put pressure on the industry to lower rates and to give money back to customers. But what they're actually doing is paying more money because they were getting in worse accidents, even though there was fewer of them. Um, so they, they did experience losses over the past couple of years. So now what's happening now, rates are going up. Everybody's rates have gone up 20, 30. There was somebody in Dallas who said their homeowner's policy is going up 50%. Any of your policies go up 50%, get on the phone in the company and start shopping because that's crazy. Um, but it does happen. Um, and, uh, you know, there's various reasons that that's going to happen. Um, but anyway, so I think... I don't think I'm going to go into much detail. Ah, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, right now, there are changing expectations for employees and customers, right? Uh, everybody wants, uh, you know, we've kind of shifted from ping pong tables and pool tables and yoga classes in the office. And now we're, you know, everybody wants to, you know, I don't need to deal with, I have found over the last year that I don't need to deal with people. I don't care. Uh, I can work on a phone. I can work on a computer. It doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, so right now, um, the industry is, is challenged with, do we bring everybody back in the office? Do we allow hybrid working? Do we allow just remote? Um, so they're, they're dealing with those challenges right now from an employee's perspective. But then there's also the customer perspective. Um, that is the, the challenges that they're dealing with. You know, nobody wants to talk to somebody. You don't want to uh, have to get on the phone and deal with somebody or go to your insurance agent's office. You just want to take a picture of your wrecked car on your phone, file your claim, and get your money deposited in your account as quickly as possible, right? Everybody wants to go to their insurance agent. No, I'm just um, so, yeah, so those are some of the challenges that they're trying to solve for. 
Um, so there's technology issues, there's remote work, um, there's the auto repair process. There's some some things going through the legislature and with the industry right now on, on how best to repair cars. So there's a battle between the auto repair companies and the insurance companies. And so uh, they want to, they want things done uh, differently. So it's working with the legislature and the regulators on how things like that can happen. Um, catalytic converter theft. So if anybody's had their catalytic converter stolen, um, you have, yeah. What it sound like when you start your car? So my car got stolen. <laughs> yeah. I got a rental and a couple days later they stole the converter off the rental car. Yeah. Oh my god, oh, you <laughs> man, stay away from you for a little bit. You got some yeah, bad luck. Ah, so. uh, okay, yeah. So that was the next issue I was going to talk about. Kias and Hyundai's right now are. Um, they have surpassed the F-150 as the most stolen car in, in San Antonio. Um, F-150 was the most stolen car for a decade or two um, in San Antonio. And then the Hyundais and the Kias surpassed it because there was a TikTok challenge. You can go steal a Kia or a Hyundai with a screwdriver or USB, USB port. It's crazy. Um, so that that has those all of those things have contributed to um, some of these challenges and these losses for um, insurance companies, and then you get into fraud, uh, whether it's customer fraud or whether it's contractor fraud. So a hailstorm or a tornado or a windstorm rolls through a town. The next day, you're going to have, you know, Joe Construction from Louisiana. They're going to roll into your town, knock on your door. Hey, I can fix your roof for, you know, $5,000. And you're like, that's weird. This guy said 10. Uh, he goes, no, 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 we can do it for five. Just sign over your insurance check to us and we'll take care of it. So people do, they sign that check over and the guy disappears with uh, with that insurance check. So that's a huge cost right now to the insurance industry. Um, the other thing is um, customer fraud. Hailstorm rolls through, a guy wants his new roof on his house. Uh, maybe the hail didn't do as much damage as he wanted it to. So he'll go up on his roof and hit his roof with a hammer, uh, a file an insurance claim and, and, uh, and all that impacts the insurance industry and all that impacts all, all of your rates because um, you know, we're not we're not just putting money in a in a bank in a, an account to file a claim. We are loaning money to all of our friends and family through insurance to to take on that risk as a as a whole. So all this fraud and um and and, and theft uh, impacts everybody's rates because everybody's paying for it. Um, that's kind of it. I think I literally am going to stop there. Um, cause we get kind of into other stuff. So I know that I flew through a lot of stuff. Any questions about scholarships or jobs or what the insurance industry is all about or anything like that? That's the scan code again for, for applications. So it's 5,000 bucks in the pocket. It's really cool. A lot of candy. All right. That's all I got. Thanks for sure. Yeah. Appreciate it. You guys didn't ask questions, so now you got to learn. So, <laughs> thanks a lot, Richard. Yeah, really absolutely, absolutely. All right, all right. I'll take this and uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, Richard. All right. Drove all the way down here from Austin. Thank you. Thanks. 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 All right, let me get set up here real quick. How many of you are doing the scholarship? Just one or two? Few? All right. Um, it is one of those scholarships where there's a, a lot of scholarship relative to the number of people applying. So there has been some years, they used to give scholarships for UTSA, and I had to go find them. And there was years where I was calling and begging people to apply. And they finally, they said, okay, I'll do it. And then two weeks later, you get a $2,000 check. He's like, oh, I'm kind of glad you told me to. It's like, yeah. So I would do it. It's a little different now because they are, um, you know, doing all the schools, but still you have a very high probability. All right. So the exam essay is due tomorrow. Someone was asking, does it have to be two o'clock? I do need several of them at two. So if you're done, send them in. I don't. I'm not real picky on a little late or late, but if I don't have enough by two o'clock, then I won't get them graded. So you won't have them back by next Tuesday. So that's the risk. I did grade all the math and y'all did really well. There's a lot of hundreds, so I was glad. So hopefully that means your essays will be higher quality as well. Hopefully we'll see. 
Um, I mean, there's no surprise on that math problem, right? There was exactly what I had shown you. So, all right. So, yeah. So the insurance industry, you know, State Farm, Allstate, USA. I think there is an advantage for a company that has multiple entities like that. So I started life insurance. And then I got into the PNC and the bank, and all the others. But I thought what was amazing for me, I did a life insurance accounting. What was amazing to me, how easy PNC was to learn once I did life first. And it's probably the other way around as well. So once you get used to insurance jargon and way insurance people talk and actuaries, you can really broaden your perspectives pretty quickly. And banking was the easiest of them all. And so it's just like this. It just piles on top of itself. You just your brain just becomes really, really easy to, to to delve in these businesses. Not that I'm saying you should work with the multi-line companies, but it certainly has some advantages. All right, so let's get back to y'all. Understand what we're doing last class. Everybody's got their laptop. So what we're gonna do tonight is this: how the how the healthcare industry. He's really talking about healthcare, not health insurance. How the healthcare system killed his father he will bring up insurance so we'll definitely get into that he covers several things in here uh and so as we go through i'm going to try to let you know where he could put so i'm trying to get you familiar with the rubric as well as getting you through the articles so so one thing he talks about is the quality of care so He's going to talk here about, I don't know how unique this is, the United States, but if you look on the rubric, this fourth one down under the problem, or fifth one down, two, three, four, five, he in this article is going to talk, talk about the poor quality of health care. So is this unique to the United States or is this something that's common around the world? So how does a nation that, you know, shuts down Jack in the Box and Bluebell ice cream and uh, Chipotle because a couple of people in one city got food poisoning, how do they do that? But then there's massive carnage in the hospital. He does mean carnage. Medical errors is like the third, we'll see it in their third leading cause of death. It's huge. Medical mistakes are huge. So that's part of the problem. And he gives a few quotes here. So he says, you know, how can that happen? How did America's, Americans learn to accept hundreds of thousands of deaths from minor medical mistakes as inevitability? How do we get used to that? I'll give you more details when we get into a few other articles. But again, I wish I knew how this is versus other countries. I just don't know. I can just know for myself, just family experiences and friends, people who show up to hospital and suddenly get some infection. Infections is a big one. We'll talk about some of the studies that have been done on doctors washing their hands, which are kind of shocking. Um, you know, it's it is an issue. Then he even talks about the solution. So the provost checklist. That's under solutions. It's an easy one. It's one of the easiest ones. It's on their solutions. It's like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine from the bottom. Something that's simple, and now this seems just too simple. But the provost checklist. I, I used to watch Grey's Anatomy. I don't anymore because I don't have a TV. It was a really pretty good show. But they had one session on this checklist. I don't know if y'all seen it. It's probably just from like 30 years ago. So uh, is anyone still alive from Great Anatomy? Is Gray still alive in Great Anatomy? She's still going around. She must be like 80 years old. I don't know. I haven't seen that show in a while. But um, but I forget which, which of the doctors was doing the checklist. But it's pretty interesting because they took it from real life. So she's going around the doctors and say, we got this checklist. And the doctors are like, hey, I'm a professional. I don't need some checklists. That's stupid. The same type of reaction we're going to see when we talk about doctors washing their hands. Something that simple can reduce, and we'll see it in some other articles. It doesn't reduce error rates by 5%, 10%. I mean, they're massive, massive. 
One other thing we're going to see is when doctors and hospitals, especially hospitals, have to report their error rates. Guess what happens to their error rate rates? They drop 80, 90 percent just because they have to go to public and report them. And so what do hospitals do? They refuse to report their numbers. <laughs> um, there's one quote. I don't have it. There's an article I read and I wish I'd kept it. But um, one of the guys pushing these checklists went to a CFO at a hospital encouraging them to incorporate this. And the, and the CFO said, why would I do that? That's a big part of our revenue is fixing these mistakes. So he didn't want to do that because it was going to cut their revenues. Because if you give someone an infection, what do you have to do? You now have to cure them from the infection. If you sew a uh, sponge in someone's stomach, you now got to do surgery again to take, take that out. That CFO said, hey, this is our mistakes as a revenue source for us. So... That's not, a, you know, we talk about incentives. That's not a good incentive. So what was that CFO thinking? He's thinking treatment. When we get to porters, what is porters going to say? How healthy is your population? If you sew a, a sponge into a patient, that's not going to improve your healthiness of your population, but it will give you more procedures. Are y'all staying up with me? All right. Y'all know y'all can say time out, professor. I'm catching up. So, <clears throat> so. Many physicians rejected them because unnecessary and belittling. Many hospital executives are reluctant to push them, either because they don't want to make the doctors upset. I'm sorry, huh? Where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. This is the one we started last week. It's called How Healthcare Killed My Father. It's like the second one in the list. Last week we did, we called it healthcare, and now we're doing the second. You already find it, so I'll let you at least get the... Yeah, it's, it's on there. Now, what have y'all seen some of these programs on airlines? Pilots go through checklists, don't they? Have you seen some of the programs? They're in the middle of the plane about the crash and they're going through a checklist. It's pretty amazing. So, and do the pilots complain? There's some some shows that say so that they miss one step on the checklist and that's why the plane crashed. I mean, it, they do it. The exact same process works in hospitals, but there's a difference with the ego. With some surgeons that like i don't need that um so some of them simple things like counting the sponges before you sew the person back up some of those can be pretty straightforward <clears throat> um so yeah i think it's the third leading cause of death but we'll see it in another article <clears throat> okay so he's going to start talking about problems and solutions here one thing he's going to say is whom do we blame so he thinks it's the collective. And because it's the collective, it's distracted us in trying to figure out the fundamental causes. Um, <clears throat> so he's going to argue they all want to do well. Now, when we're going we're to look at one book where there's definitely some bad actors in this industry. There's definitely some fraud. There's definitely some people out there to make money. You're going you're to see a couple of doctors that are actually cutting people off, up knowing they don't have cancer in order to cure their cancer. There are doctors like that. That's so not everybody is out there that make this better, but probably most doctors are. So all of the actors, he says all, I don't agree with that, work in a heavily regulated, that's true, massively subsidized industry. They all want to serve patients well. Again, I don't agree with that all, but but they also behave rationally. And so here's great quote. They all behave rationally in response to economic incentives those distortions create. I think that's true. Everything we're going to see, it's incentives. If you pay doctors for the number of surgeries they do, they do more surgeries, even when it's not necessary. So that key of, of incentives. So Porter's going to talk about this. How do we change the incentives? We talked last class, you know, on health. You know, I think, you know, you don't get one body. You know, is giving people more money going to do that? Well, we live in a world where it's really hard to stay fit. We have desk jobs. We got corn syrup and every single food we buy. I'm passing candy around for y'all to eat. It's really tough. Food is just everywhere and the food industry is out there to kill us because, you know, sugar is a cheap thing to sell us. So I don't think you can just argue we just pay patients to stay fitter. That's going to because if that were the case, they would already everybody be already doing that. So it's tough. 
So is there a way to change incentives? So so people will, will be healthier. So hospitals will treat the right kind of people. That's what Porter is going to address. It is not an easy equation, but that's what he's saying. That's the problem. The problem here is incentives. That gets back to what in the rubric? Well, it gets back to what we talked about at the very, very beginning, which is the players. So that quote might be a good pl place to put when you're talking about the players, right? That'd be a pretty good connection to say, hey, the key here is not that the players are evil. The key is what are their incentives? And so I like that quote. I may not be copying every single time we do that. But I, I like that quote as a great introduction here. You don't have to do it, but you know, if I were doing it, I would I kind of like that. How many people don't behave according to the incentives? Everybody does, right? Mother Teresa. She wants to be a good person, go to heaven. You know, that's the incentive. That's how they're, you know, everybody has an incentive that they're working toward. In every place, it can be good incentives, evil incentives, uh, but that is those incentives is what the distortions create. They're reacting to how they're paid, how they're incentivized. We saw that with life insurance, right? Life insurance had an incentive to stay in business, so they they acted in ways that are questionable in order to meet those incentives. All right, so. You get these perverse results because the incentives emphasize health care over all other aspects of health and well-being. They emphasize treatment over prevention. So you're going to see in the rubric this concept down here of treatment versus prevention. That is the incentive right now. Why? Because you get hospitals and doctors are paid for treating people, not for making them well. When the incentive is treatment, that's what they're going to do. What if the incentive was prevention? What if hospitals were paid based on how healthy their population was? Well, then we'd see more dietitians. We'd see more uh, bicycle tracks. We'd see more rehabilitation centers. We'd be see more gyms and gym memberships. Um, we'd have more home visits. I mean, can you believe that? We're going to talk about that later. Is it possible home visits is cheaper? And the arguments can be, yeah, home visits, if they encourage people to stay with their diet, stay with their pills, stay with their routine, you can actually save money by sending nurses out. My my executive MBA class, a couple of them, we have a lot of medical students in there, and a couple of them for their cost-benefit analysis are doing these home care kind of new businesses are propping up and they're pretty interesting. They're franchised. I don't know if y'all have seen some of these and they're trying to address this issue of how can we keep our patients healthy by having someone in their face more frequently. Um, so that's the prevention model. The prevention model is getting people to be healthier. The treatment model is you almost, it's the opposite, right? Y'all gonna watch, I'm gonna give you the video and I don't know when we'll do the walk. I'll give you the video, hope it still works. But that one doctor, I forget his exact quote, but it's essentially I'm paying, I'm paid for harming my patients. And that's a pretty horrible thing to say, but that's that focus on treatment over prevention. Now, do I need to copy each time I do this or can y'all kind of keep up with me? Y'all see where I got that? Because it, it's kind of hard for me to go back and forth. So the incentives emphasize treatment over prevention. So what he's gonna say is prevention is more than hospitals and doctors, it's other things. It's good quality water. It's having sidewalks instead of roads. You know, in the UK, they're getting really mad because they're making places where cars can't go and there's supposed to be all these bicycles. And so these drivers are like, I can't even leave my neighborhood anymore, you know, it's, but that's what they're trying to do, get people to exercise more. We're gonna talk about this as well. We'll get to this later, so don't worry about it here, but the cost transparency is a huge one with healthcare. We really don't know what we're paying for and we don't care because the insurance company is paying for it. And it's, it is a mess. Um, hospital charging codes are very complicated. Complexity, they discourage transparent, and we're gonna talk about how that affects competition in a later article. So here's one of the things he, he's hinting out that we're gonna get to later. 
we need transparency on price and quality. All right, when we get the Porter, Porter's gonna talk about the value equation. The value equation is quality versus cost. All right, what this guy's saying is it's so complex, it's so lacking in transparency, there's no way to make a decision about quality relative to the price. You don't know when you pay more that you're getting any higher quality. And that's pretty serious for any business, right? If you didn't know a Porsche was better than a, um, I don't know my cars, better than a Yugo, y'all don't know what a Yugo is, but if you didn't know that, it could be the same quality, that's gonna make it really difficult to buy a car. So you might assume the Porsche is better because it's so much more expensive, but if there's a chance they're exactly the same, that's a pretty bad business. We don't have that much trouble with cars because there's all the people reviewing it. But when you go into surgery, how well do you know that that doctor is really high quality? Do y'all know that? How do you pick your surgeon? You pick it based on who's going to pay what, what's in your insurance network, what, what your, your, your local doctor recommended you to go to. How do you know? If you knew that, would that make a difference in your decision? We're going to talk later about some quality differences that are really quite dramatic. You're going to see on the um, on the video on um, prostate prostate cancer, the error rates there are very widely different. An error rate with prostate cancer has a huge impact on quality of life. What do you think? Having to use adult diapers. When you, if you had a different doctor, you wouldn't have to do that. Would that be important to your grandparents' life, do you think? Incontinence, is that a very serious thing? If one doctor has an 18% error rate and one has a 2% error rate, would you want to know that before you go into the surgery? Would you be willing to pay more for the 2% than the 18? And what if the 18% error rate was more expensive than the 2%? That's how distorted this industry is. Why? Because we have no data. Can an industry function if the consumers have no data on costs and quality, and they don't care about cost because the insurance is paying for it. So you see how this industry is really, really different than other industries. So it's a pyramid scheme rather than uh, sustainable finance. It removes, and this this is really key. Key. We're going to talk about consumerism. Re removes consumers from the ones who ensure value. Again, remember, value is quality and cost. It's both of them. It's not just quality. All right. You say, hey, this surgeon is the best in the world. I'm going to go to him. I'm going to go to her. She charges $2 billion. Okay, well, that's that's good quality, but the cost is ridiculous. So you're looking for that combination of quality and cost. I we talked about it previous, how, like, you know, uh, doing the surgery and putting in sponge on accident or on accident. Uh, well, I think they are. I'm quite new. <laughs> uh, so... But my question is, isn't there such a thing as malpractice and doing people? Yeah, there is. Um, we're not going to talk about that too much here. There is, but uh, not everything goes. You know, you get you pick up a, an infection in a hospital, proving that it was the hospital's fault because infections happen all the time. There is that. There is that. That's one of our things on our list. We're not going to talk about it a whole lot, but there is there is that aspect of um, malpractice insurance premiums being high and addressing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 the hospitals make more money doing that kind of stuff than they pay in the premium. So it, it's, it's, it's just not enough because it's hard. Um, yeah, I don't know percentage and um, what percentage of those kind of things actually get go to trial. Um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, there's um, some things like when they amputate the wrong leg. I, I imagine 100 percent of those go. Because that's a pretty, you know, that's something you're supposed to check a million times. Um, so something like that, yeah. The biggest lawsuits tend to be pediatric. You know, it's birth, those type of things. Um, but I don't know what percentage of infections in a hospital actually get sued. I, I bet it's not a very high percentage, but I don't, I don't know that side. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about this more in later articles. But you'll see at the end of the rubric in the solutions, this idea of consumerism. So this is really something he talks about, and we'll see in a few other articles. It's not really Porter as much, but it's a little bit. 
How can we get consumers to consume healthcare the same way they consume other things? Where they make decisions based on price and quality. Right? So if you're buying a car and you didn't know which car was better, there were all different prices, but you weren't paying for it. Someone else was paying for it. That's a very different market than what you currently do with cars. And so what we're trying to do is convert healthcare into other types of products. Now, why do you think distorts that the most? That's what he's going to talk about. He thinks insurance distorts it the most. And we saw that in the previous article as well, right? Insurance is a big part of that. So this idea of consumerism, making consumers consume healthcare like they do other products is, is a big part of what he's talking about. So how do we get consumers back into the value equation? Now, Porter's a little bit different. Porter's trying to get the value creation on the supply side. So how much of it is the supply side? How much is it the demand side, right? The Affordable Care Act is really focused on the demand side, getting more people covered. But if you get more people covered in a very distorted industry, that may not be a good solution. You just got more people in a system that's broken and it's, it's maybe not gonna end up giving you the best solution in the end. So some of these we're gonna see in other articles a little bit more comprehensively. Um, now, this is a this is pre Affordable Care Act, but he knows what Affordable Care Act is going to do, and his response is actually the way Affordable Care Act actually came out. So the comprehensive reform being contemplated, and he put comprehensive in quotes for a reason, merely cements in place the current system. All right, so you can see right here what he doesn't like: insurance based, employment centered, complex. He says these are the problems. And the Affordable Care Act just cements that more in place. He, he thinks the Affordable Care Act is actually encouraging the very problem that he's trying to solve. So you saw that in the first article, right? Insurance base, what's the problem with that? Insurance is covering everything. The, per, the consumer doesn't care about price because they're not paying for it. Employment center, what's the problem with that? The employer, the, the employer just wants to get something to the employee they're not really thinking about the employee's health. They just need to get them enough so the employee will work there and not go work somewhere else. So what would happen if you eliminated a lot of insurance and people bought their own policies away from work? That's essentially where he's going. Now, the administrative complex, I don't think he addresses that much, but it addresses the underlying causes of a health care crisis only obliquely, if at all, indeed, by extending the current system more people. Essentially what I was just saying, you're not going to fix the system by getting more people to demand the product. I had the same thing on, um, you know, not to debate Bernie Sanders. I wish you were here, but this whole idea of free college education. I think there's serious incentive problems in the college education world, throwing more students at the problem. I don't think I think you got to fix the problem first before you open up. So I'm I'm kind of if the problem is supply. Don't try to get more demand, fix the supply problem. Are, it's hard to do them both at the same time, right? So do you fix the man or su fix supply? I think you got to address supply and then fix the man. But we have so many uninsured people, you kind of say, well, we got to do something on the man side. But um, but he's he's essentially making that same argument. Don't throw more people into a broken, broken system. It will likely increase the ultimate cost of true reform. And that's another important point here with the Affordable Care Act to get more people in the system, it's going to be harder to really fix it later. And I, I do think this is part of the issue with the Affordable Care Act. Um, I mean, I applaud President Obama for, I mean, tackling something really, really tough. I think he understands the no problem, the supply side problems. I also think he wasn't going to touch that because it's political uh, suicide to touch the supply side because that is a very powerful force of uh, lobbying. Um, but the problem is you have this big Affordable Care Act, which is so controversial it's gonna make the next major reform even more difficult because everybody's gonna remember how painful the last one was. So true reform is just really tough in a democratic system, but you don't have to worry about that. You're a king for a day, you can do whatever you want to, but real reform is very, very difficult. Um, again, he talks about incentives. So here's another quote you could use for the incentive part if you wanted to. I believe that unless we fix the problems at the foundation of our healthcare system, largely problems of incentives, our reforms won't do much good or may do harm. So either one of those quotes I think would work well in going into the players. So 
thanks. She, thanks for letting me know you need to get out. Thanks. Yeah. She told me in advance, so don't, don't panic. <laughs> I do appreciate that that she told me she had to go out early, and that really helps me because I told her, don't get up and leave right after I say something controversial because then I'm going to be like paranoid all night long. So. <laughs> Right. Now, one year I, I, I joked and I said, I dare you to write this paper without using the word incentive. And one of the students tried to do that. I was joking. No, I think incentives is, is going to have the word incentive, I think, is going to have to be in your paper. Um, um, all right. Again, it gets back to the consumer system side. When you get healthcare to be like other parts of the economy. All right. So, again, reduce, not expand insurance. Why do you need like the Portal Care Act? It expanded insurance. Focus the government's role exclusively on things government can do. This is very similar to the first article, protective for and against true catastrophes. This is a big part of his solution. Is government really their focus after you take care of the poor, their focus should be on catastrophic things. They shouldn't focus on anything else. And he means that for Medicare, Medicaid, veterans, the government should only be paying for catastrophic stuff. Everything else should come out of your pockets. That's a pretty radical idea. You can imagine, imagine AARP hearing that solution and what their reaction would be. Enforce safety standards. Why? Because his dad was killed by the hospital. Ensure provider competition. Again, you can't have competition if the consumer, the consumer of the product doesn't have knowledge on quality and cost. Those are absolutely required. <clears throat> Um, hidden subsidies, ma manipulated prices, undisclosed results. We need to rely more on ourselves, the consumer, as the ultimate guarantor of good service, reasonable prices, sensible trade offs between healthcare spending and spending on other good things. Um, so <clears throat> he said before spending a trillion dollars or so in reform, we need a much clearer understanding of the causes of the problem. So here he's going to get into the cause side. So comments up to this point. The main thing is you see his point because you don't have to agree with him, but to understand his point. So you can see some of the arguments that he's making. You can agree with some of his points and others disagree with. Um, all right. So when it comes to healthcare, there's a lot more to than just hospitals and doctors. We tend to focus on healthcare being uh, what insurance pays for. And he's saying, no, healthcare is not what insurance in healthcare is education, it's public safety, it's the environment, it's infrastructure. There's a lot of things that impact our health. So you think about Flint, Michigan and the bad water, that's a pretty horrible thing, right? These poor children are getting exposed to lead. It's going to make them developmentally, it's going to slow them down, right? That's a pretty serious thing to do, to slow someone's development down, give them some cognitive issues. Would we be better off? Rather than spending all this money on some of these healthcare things that are no benefit, spending billions of dollars cleaning up water, that's essentially his argument. What mechanism does society determine that an extra hundred billion for healthcare will make us healthier than 10 billion on better water, 25 billion on nutrition, 5 billion for parks, 10 billion on recreation? So he's making the economic argument of, um, oh, I've just got the word. Um, What's the word? But and you, you, if you do this, you can't do that. All right. I can't remember. But um, so spending trillions of dollars on doctors and hospitals and pharma means we can't spend trillions of dollars on something that may actually make us healthier. <clears throat> Opportunity costs. Thank you. Boy, 60 years old is really rough. I can't imagine 70. Um, <clears throat> He uses a housing bu bubble as an example. When government tries to incentivize certain things, you get too much of it. And that's part of what we're going to talk about with the tax incentive for health insurance. That means we have too much health insurance, which means we use too much insurance, which means we buy too much health care versus buying other things. So the distorting demand raises prices, making us all poor by crowding out the other things. Um, <clears throat> The next problem he's going to talk about is we mix the term. This is almost identical to the first article. We confuse health insurance with health care. So you hear politicians say, hey, they don't have access to health care. When what they really mean is they don't have access to health insurance. A very, very different thing. Um, so millions of Americans have no health care when what he or she meant is they had no health insurance. 
how has a method of financing healthcare become synonymous with the care itself? And I remember after reading this article during the Affordable Care Act times, which was what, 2009? Um, Y'all were alive in 2009, weren't you? 13 years old. So were you paying attention back then? Uh, huh? Yeah, well, okay. yeah, so some of you are 15, 20, but yeah, but most of you are, you know, probably more focused on other things, even if you're 20. Uh, but um, I remember I used to be at the gym watching this. This is when I used to go to the gym on the bike. And I love logic. I took logic class classes in college. I highly recommend logic classes. Classes are really, really good. So anytime I saw a politician, I would take their argument and I'd put it into a logic construction. And usually their argument was, if you don't believe me, just ask me. It was like, I'm the source of all truth, anything, you know, so it wasn't a really good list of premises. But on the healthcare side, I started listening to some of their arguments and trying to put them into this. And a lot of times it was hard to construct the argument because they were talking about insurance, but they were using the word healthcare. And it gets really confusing if you're talking about insurance availability, but you're using the word healthcare it's hard for me to construct that argument because providing health insurance and providing health care are two really, really different things. So health, ins health insurance is different than any other type of insurance. Health insurance is the primary payment mechanism, not just for expenses that are unexpected and large, but for nearly all health care expenses. We become so used to health insurance that we don't realize how absurd that is. We can't imagine paying for gas with our auto insurance policy or for our electric bills with our homeowner's insurance, but we all assume, and this is so true, that our regular checkups and dental cleanings will be covered impartially by insurance. Most pregnancies are planned and deliveries are predictable, yet they're financed the same way we finance fixing a car after a wreck through an, an insurance claim. So this whole quote, it's maybe too much, but you could probably garner some of this out and put it under this, um, this section of defining an insurable event. It really does fit in there very, very well. I need to start saving this document and putting it out there. I'll put the final one out there. It's gonna probably be so messy, it won't help you any. But y'all see how those are related. He's saying very similar thing to that first, that first article said. Insurance should not cover everything. Why does it cover everything? We'll talk about that when we talk about the tax incentives for insurance. This is back to what he was talking about, the housing market. When government incentivizes something, we get way too much of it. And that's essentially where we are on the insurance, according to his argument. I'm going to leave this last part out because I don't want anybody to slash my tires. But he does have a pretty radical view on maternal care <laughs> that some of y'all might not want to put in your paper. I won't share your papers with anyone, so you can be as radical as you want. <clears throat> so... Comprehensive health insurance is just so ingrained that we forget um, that this is pretty rel pretty re uh, recently um, put upon us. It hasn't been true forever and ever. And it's the tax benefit, all right? So let's look at the tax side. We're gonna get into it more in other articles. You can notice health insurance tied to employment and the tax treatment, I have them together. Those two are related. So some of y'all might know the history of this. So during World War II, there were wage caps. The government says you can't pay people more, so they capped wages. And so employer says, well, we can't pay you salary. Why don't we just give you other benefits? We'll give you free lunches. USA used to have subsidized lunches. They don't do that anymore, but that was kind of cool, right? Um, we'll give you free whatever. Well, one of the things they said is we'll give you, we'll give you health care. And that doesn't get counted against your salary. So instead of paying you fifty thousand, we'll pay you forty-five thousand and give you five thousand dollars of health insurance. All right. So what should the government do with that? Well, they didn't cap it, so you could have done five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand. You could do whatever you want to. Well, the government made a big mistake. I don't know the exact history of this. Be interesting. Go back to the IRS. So the IRS now has a decision to make. The person was making fifty thousand, and that was all taxable. Now they're making forty-five thousand and getting five thousand in health care. How much of that should be taxable? Well, obviously fifty thousand should be taxable. What did the IRS decide? Only forty-five thousand is taxable. The health care that your employer pays is tax-free. 
That's a huge, huge decision. Um, and so what does that incentivize? Let's see, I can get 50,000 that's all taxable. I can get 45,000 that's taxable and 5,000 less taxable. I can get 40,000 that's taxable and 10,000 that's not taxable. Y'all see the, so it's just kind of, the, the employer has an incentive to give more healthcare because that's a bigger benefit. You get to increase the benefit because it's tax-free. The employer gets a tax deduction. They don't care. 45,000, 50,000, they're gonna get a tax deduction of 50,000. They don't care how it's split. The employee only pays for the part of the salary The healthcare is tax-free. There is no other benefit like that. So your 401k plan, you don't pay tax when you set it up. You don't pay tax while you're accumulating, but what happens when you retire? All taxable, right? Pension plans, same thing, all right? The IRS, they may give you a tax deduction today, but they're gonna tax you in the future. They may give you a tax deduction and tax deferral, but they're going to eventually tax you. Roth IRA, what to do with that one? Never taxable, but you don't get the tax deduction today. So that's usually the way the IRS is, except for healthcare. Tax free to you today, tax deductible to the employer, and never taxable to you ever. It's a huge, huge benefit. All right. Why is it tied to employment? Because that's how the tax benefit got. Self employed people don't get that. Right, self-employed people, they have to buy their health care with after tax dollars. I don't know why self-employed haven't revolted, but it's a huge disadvantage for them. But self-employed don't get that benefit. Only people working for firms get that benefit. So it, those two are related to each other and it's huge. It's one, it's essentially the largest tax benefit there is in our tax code. So this seemingly minor tax benefit not only encouraged the spread of catastrophic insurance, but had the accidental effect and making employer-funded health insurance the most affordable after tax for financing pretty much any health care. So it used to be, yeah, you, you, you need health insurance for those big expenses. And the employer said, well, you know what, might as well cover your doctor's visits because your doctor visits is hundred bucks. Why not cover it tax-free? You know, it's a better, bigger benefit. And so everything just suddenly got covered. Not because it made sense, on a before tax, it, it made sense because of the tax code. Now, what happens if one employer does that? What are all the other employers going to do? <clears throat> they're all going to copy it, right? Remember, they don't care because their tax deduction is the same. They all have to copy each other, and then becomes this uh, this kind of arms race of who can provide the most employee benefit. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting when you look at uh, incomes in the United States somewhat distorted because incomes look like they've been rising, but that includes the healthcare benefit the employer is providing. If healthcare benefits, if that cost is going up, but the amount of coverage you're getting is not going up just because healthcare is going up, you're not really getting a raise. It's just more of your money is going toward healthcare. You're getting the same healthcare. So it can really distort a lot of things. Um, so you're going to see, you need to have some numbers here. This is one place where you can get part of that extra credit, you know, that other, uh, give me more current numbers because I'm going to give you some kind of older numbers, but you can get what is that tax benefit today? And who gets who gets the advantage of that tax advantage the most? It's going to be the wealthiest people because it's related to your tax your tax rate. The higher your tax rate, the more valuable this is to you. So it's, it's a tax incentive that is skewed toward the wealthy And sometimes this, the problem is the solution. So we're gonna talk here. I should have put these two together, but I didn't. Untie health insurance to the employer. Catherine reminded me it was Rom Emanuel. That's such a cool first name. I don't know why I don't remember, but Ron, is it R-A-H-M, R-O-M, what is it? R-O-M, yeah, Rahm Emanuel. Yeah, his book was, he didn't, Hide it that yeah if the thing works employers won't be providing health health insurance to the employees yeah that's that could be the incentive I'm in that camp employers just stop doing it now I thought Affordable Care Act might actually drive that you need one big employer to do that say you know what we were paying you forty thousand and we're spending ten thousand on health care you know what we're just going to give you fifty thousand you do the ten thousand whatever you want and we're going to stop doing that. It hasn't happened yet. I think employers are scared to do that. But I do think if a few large employers start doing that, it could be a pretty 
pretty big wildfire uh, uh, and all employers doing it. But it will especially happen if the IRS changes the tax code. The IRS says employers, you either don't get the tax deduction or employees, you got to pay the tax. That's going to write it because then the employer has no incentive to do it, right? They don't. Do you think employers want to be in health insurance business? Do you think they really want to provide that? You know, USA has an actuary, or they did when I was there, had an actuary just for their health insurance for their employees. That's a pretty expensive position, isn't it? You're paying something, somebody a couple hundred thousand bucks just because you're providing health insurance to your employees. Just think if they just got rid of that, they had to mess with it. It's, it's a mess. It really is a huge uh, headache for executives. I think most companies would love to just get rid of that problem and not have to deal with it at all. Now, what would you think as an employee? You were paid 40,000, you got 10,000 healthcare, now you're getting 50,000, but no health insurance. Would you prefer that? Even if you have to pay tax on the 10,000? So that's what we're gonna talk through. So that's one of the possible solutions. I'm gonna talk about the difference between credits and deductions when we get to that part of the discussion. I'm, I'm in the camp that you change it from a deduction to a credit. But we'll get into that. What if the employer, what, what if they tell employees to go out and seek out health care on their own and submit it as an expense? Make it more like spending it for your health care. Well, we're going to talk, yeah, we're definitely going to talk about the, the HSA or MSA, medical savings account, health savings accounts. So I, I do think there's could be an incentive, and that's where my tax credit kind of thing comes in, uh, where, well, we'll get into that. We're going to kind of get ahead of that. But yeah, there, the tax side to me is a bigger part of the problem than most people, I think, really realize. Because a lot of people ask, oh, we're out of time. Why is the U.S. so different than the rest of the world? I do think the tax side is a huge part of that. And so we're going to get into that. All right. So we'll, we'll stop it there. Um, so I'll put it here.